of the Biohacker Summit 2019. Yeah. Here with us, we have Casper van der Moulen. Good enough. Did I say it right. <laughs> How can you use breathing when you feel anxiety? Well, first of all, um, what's important to understand is what anxiety really is. Right? So mainly anxiety is a state that you get within your nervous system that wants you to do something about your situation, just like stress. Like every, every physiological system we have is there to serve us in some way. What we call anxiety is of course an unwanted state where we feel anxious or fearful or stressed in a certain environment or with uh, certain thoughts. So it's there for a reason and it's there to you know make you more alert, see patterns, connect dots and make you look for a safe solution to whatever you're in. But of course, if you're feeling suddenly anxious about life or about worries, uh, about thoughts that you have, um, and it catches you, it's not really actually a useful state. So you want to be able to change the state when you need to. Now, the first thing to do is to study the anxiety. And this is something that a lot of people that are looking for biohacks or tips, they want to get the solution first before understanding how it works. Now, if you have anxiety, you can do th two things. You can say, you know, I'm anxious, I'm not feeling well, I'm pushing it away. Push it away, push it away. Let's take uh, whatever drugs or drink tea or go for a run, which is could work, of course. Um, but you can also sit down and study it, which just means try to take uh, a viewer's per perspective and try to watch the anxiety happen in your body. How does it behave? What's it doing? If you do that, you'll very soon notice that anxiety makes your shoulders go up and breathe into your chest. Usually people have shallow upper chest breathing, which is suboptimal, right? So you, if you sit down and study anxiety in yourself, you can actually see that your breathing is changing because you're anxious. Now, the kind of breathing that belongs to feeling safe and calm and relaxed is a very steady, slow nose breathing. Um, and in order to get there, you can start to lengthen your exhales. So there's many breathing techniques that directly influence um, uh, anxiety. And they all have to do with uh, controlled breathing, controlled exhales, which stimulate the vagus nerve, which allow you for, give you a relaxation response. And a lot of times it also has to do with getting less oxygen. So the combination of those two things, less oxygen, more CO2 and long breaths, will calm down your body. Because if you have less oxygen, your body has to go at a slower pace and there's no room for anxiety there. Um, so lengthening the exhale, for example, or just chanting, chanting an ohm or singing a song, all of those things will force your breathing into a controlled pattern with longer exhales that allow you to calm down. And then there's, of course, uh, different methods that are really powerful as tools to really deal with anxiety in a therape therapeutic way. Like, for example, the Wim Hof Method, which is a practice that people can do. You can learn online at WimHofMethod.com, and it's like a very simple way to take 20 or 30 minutes and completely reset the anxiety response. And there's things like, for example, Buteyko, who focus on eventually having the same result, but on a more intricate, small changes of breathing patterns. So there's a lot of methods out there. Um, and... Actually, they're all great. <laughs> they all work. As long as you sit down and take a conscious practice and are willing to feel what the anxiety is doing to you and how you can influence it with breathing. Very interesting. We have another question here from our live stream watchers. Could you shortly explain how we could train our children to use breathing as a tool? Yeah, so uh, that's a big topic. Um, usually when children are born, their breathing is perfect. Uh, um, and especially in the first year, the breathing patterns really start to develop. So if a child doesn't encounter too many stressors, or too many things that would mess up their breathing into a more contracted or uh, like a more hyperventilative pattern, they will usually keep it really well. So their baseline breathing, so to speak, is actually really, uh, usually really good. And one of the things we used to do when my daughter was just born was just go into her bedroom when she's sleeping at night and watch her breathe because it's so perfect and everything is happening exactly as it should. Um, 
But, of course, as you grow up, life happens and you want to have interventions. And one thing I've done with my daughter is as soon as things get difficult or she gets very stressed uh, or I get stressed, I say, let's take a deep breath together. And the deep breath is more of a break from the state because you're in a state and it's like ah, crying or angry or up here and like that. And then if you go, ah, just calm down at the end of that breath, that can really help. So what I'm mainly trying to do is be a role model for my daughter where I show you're in this state now, but we could change the state through breathing. I'm not going to sit her down and do like a long breathing practice. It's kind of boring for kids. When kids get older and they start to understand that they can make conscious choices over how they behave, then it makes sense for them to learn, for example, to take a very long exhale or to exhale and wait whenever they feel stressed or they feel worried. And this is something that I did do with my kids when I was a science teacher, uh, my, my students. They were 13 or 14 and having freak outs before tests or being really worried. And I'd say, okay, before we have a conversation, take a deep breath, exhale and wait. And that kind of breaks the state and then you can have a conversation. And I actually recently heard about a guy uh, who uh, whenever his kids would come to him and they were stressed or they want something and blah, 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 they would just say like, okay, you know what? You take three deep breaths and then you come back and talk to me. So it's more about giving children the awareness that they can take responsibility over the state they're in before they engage in communication than about giving them a protocol that they have to do. Because I'm already noticing now with my daughter, she's now four, and sometimes when she's like uh, upset or whatever and I say, okay, let's take a deep breath. She's like, I don't want to take a deep breath, right? So she's already kind of like rebelling from it. So I don't, like it never helps to push and it always helps more to be a role model of, uh, for children. So like, I'm going to take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to take a deep breath. And yeah. For people who wake up in the middle of the night, is there a way to use breathing to fall asleep again more easily or... Well, sure, if their breathing is out of control. And most people who wake up in the middle of the night and they feel worried or, or stressed or whatever, they usually have already been breathing through their mouth and into their chest while they were asleep, which gives you a very suboptimal oxygen and CO2 exchange and also triggers your uh, sympathetic system. Because like you're sleeping, you're supposed to have the calmest, most restful breathing, but they're breathing like they're doing a workout, right? Like, for example, snoring. So the first thing you have to do is do a check-in and to see whether you're actually... Uh, whether it's actually your breathing that's, that's messed up. And if that's the reason, then uh, my favorite technique for getting to sleep is the 478 technique uh, from Dr. Andrew Weil. And it's basically you breathe in for four counts, you hold that for seven counts, and then you breathe out for eight counts. And you do that four or five times, right? And every time you do that long exhale, your body calms down a little bit. Then you inhale, you hold it for seven seconds. You're basically telling your body, listen, you're not getting any more oxygen. You better calm down. And then you do a long exhale, still not getting new oxygen, but the exhale stimulates the resting part of the nervous system. And usually I do four or five rounds of that. And sometimes I call it my sleeping pill because it's just like a super effective way to fall asleep or to fall back asleep. Is there a way to, you were saying that some people don't breathe at the optimal way when they're sleeping. Is there a way to train yourself to not breathe in a stress state or does that have to do more with what you do before you go to bed? Or? Um, yes, so one thing you can do is to uh, really reset your resting system before you go to sleep. So that means that um, a lot of people rush into bed because it's like, oh, it's late, I need to do a thing, check my emails, I don't know, put the phone away, eyes closed and go. And just doing a breathing practice that calms down the breathing sets a new pace for your body to keep during the night. So that's a very effective way to do it. Uh, in the Buteco method, they uh, advise uh, putting a strip of tape over your lips when you sleep, which has been very effective for me because most people have naturally or unnaturally have their mouth fall open when they sleep, which means that they're always breathing mouth and chest. So um, just a way to nose breathe. And, you know, it should not be the kind of tape that you can't get off if it's, if it's not enough air, of course. And it sounds a bit scary and a bit weird, but it really helps people to... I mean, if you get eight hours of sleep with mouth breathing or eight hours of sleep with nose breathing, that nose breathing sleep will be far higher quality. And I can actually notice it, uh, thanks to my, uh, my measurements for my sleep quality, that if I wake up and somewhere during the night I t took the tape off, I can see that my sleep quality is always lower and I get less deep sleep. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a few Very ways. Very interesting. You mentioned snoring. Is that also a sign of stress? Or what's Could that be. About? Snoring is a bit more uh, complicated because some people have actual apnea. Uh, sometimes it has to do with uh, a poor lifestyle and bad conditions. So it's it's a, it's a giant topic that I haven't mastered completely myself. Okay. I still like I'm still working on the snoring. Yeah.
Okay. Do you have any last takeaway words of wisdom for our live stream audience before we close? What's um, your most important hack? Well, my most important, well, the most important quality skill of anything is awareness. So you can only really start to change your breathing if you're aware of the breathing you're doing. You can only change your state if you're aware of the state you're in. You can only ch like increase your life quality if you're aware of the life quality you're in. So taking awareness to the practice is the most important thing. And that's what I also said on stage. Some people, they go like, oh, here's a breathing trick. Let me just try that randomly without sitting down and being aware. You can actually mess up your breathing pattern if you're not aware with how you're doing it, right? So taking time for awareness is more important than anything else. And a lot of times, if you just sit down and be aware of your breathing, it will already fall into a more natural pattern simply because you're watching it and you're being aware of it and taking control of it. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Casper. And thank, thank you. you to everyone for being here today with us on our Biohacker Summit 2019 live stream. See you later. Thank you. All right. Thank you.